Hello and welcome everybody. Really excited to be able to host this virtual session today. My name is Julius Lang. I will be representing the Helvetian Investment Club today, the largest student-run finance society of Switzerland um, based here at the University of St. Gallen. With me today, I have two very, very special guests. We're incredibly honored um, to, to have you both here um, with, a, with a value investing background. Still, we did not want to focus or at least limit ourselves to investing today. Um, we believe that there lies great value um, to be to be picked up in this session today beyond investing. So usually in, in our live sessions, we now have a, a warm applause. I sure hope my little intro will do. Thank you very much, Monish Fabrai and Guy Spear for being here with me today. It's a pleasure. Julius, it, it's our pleasure to be with you. So um, maybe maybe starting it off still, um, as I said, we don't want to limit ourselves to investing, but but let's kick it off since it's the the um, in our our same the nominator um, in, in for that matter. Monish, you in a previous interview, you said um, you started out investing in '95, and and one of the the four stocks that you initially picked. Um, turned out to be a 140 bagger, if I remember correctly. So why don't you tell us um, to, to maybe get everybody on board here? What is it that it's that is so great about value investing? Why do you do it? And why do you keep doing it? Yeah, well, Julius, it's a pleasure to be here. And with all of you, I haven't done this type of a format before. So it's always fun to expand my horizons, which is wonderful. Yeah, in uh, 95, I ran to this company in India. I was looking to, I was managing about a million dollars and I uh, wanted to just step my toe into India a little bit. What I actually should have done in hindsight would have, should have been a lot more than just a toe. But I put $20,000 of that 1 million into Indian equities. And at, at that time, it was very cumbersome to actually open an account and trade and all that. But anyway, I got all that done. And there was a company, Satyam Computer Services. I was in the IT business at the time. And I knew these guys because they, uh, their sales guys would meet me and want to do business together and whatever else. And I, I liked the company. I admired uh, some of the people and such. And I was surprised that uh, when I looked at the business in 95, this was a company that was growing probably 60, 70% a year. And, and it, it was uh, going to be doing that for quite a while. The market cap of the business was less than the value of their real estate in Hyderabad. So basically, you were buying it below, uh, you know, real book value, significantly below that. And uh, no one was concerned about the earning stream, which was very significant. And so I had no idea how big this business would get or what type of return I would get. What I decided to do, at that time, India did not have DMAT. So I got these kind of very flimsy stock certificates in my home in Chicago after I bought and they're like kind of falling apart, whatever else. And I basically stuck them in the bottom of my desk drawer and I said, okay, you know, we don't need to really open this drawer pretty much forever. Just kind of, because these are good businesses and we just let them do their thing and so on. And that's, that's kind of what I, what I focused on. And it, then, you know, we had the dot-com bubble and then the dot-com bust. So Satyam had spun out a dot-com company and then from mid-99 onwards, the stock started going crazy. And I think in January, February of 2020, I decided to take a look at the business again in terms of the valuation because it had gone up over 100x. And I couldn't make head or tail of those numbers. I mean, I think it was in deep in bubble territory. And 10,000, I, I had put half the bet in India into Satyam. So 10,000 that I put in was sitting at about like 1.3, 1.4 million. And the Indian government theoretically had told me that I could repatriate it all back. And India has a lot of exchange control. So I didn't have a lot of confidence in what they were saying. So I said, I wonder if they'll let me, you know, take the 1.4 million out just like that. And so I gave the sell order. And then I also told them to wire the funds. And the next day the funds were with me and I, it all went very smoothly. So that was that. And then the stock dropped, I think, 70% or so in the next 18 months when it came down to more rational valuations. Had some controversy uh, much later when they started cooking their books, et cetera. It wasn't a situation that was prevalent in the company in the duration that I owned it. That started really several years after I had exited. Amazing. I mean, highlighting our, our very special setup today, um, as, as, I, as I previously mentioned, our esteemed previous guest, Guy, is with us as well. Um, Guy, having having known Monish for, for a long time um, and, and 
having mentioned one example of, of a great investment, what do you believe, Guy Monish, um, to to make or distinguish from other value investors, and what is it actually that that uh, makes a great value investor? You know, Julius, there's only one person whom I've now introduced to Monish that I won't name here because I don't have his permission that has as unusual mind as Monish does. And um, there are so many circumstances, including what I described in the Buffett lunch, where he took a set of facts that was available for everyone, but saw them in a completely different way and, uh, and, and arranged them in a different way. And, it, and just to give you very briefly, this is an example of how uh, Monish thinks differently. I meet him for breakfast at the Mandarin Oriental Hotel with a view over the park. And he says, you know, um, I'm going to bid again on the launch with Buffett. Would you like to join me? Something like that. And I kind of respond to him with a, what a stupid idea. <laughs> and within five minutes, he explained to me why it was not a stupid idea. And I completely adopted the thinking. So um, uh, what makes Monish an unusual investor is that capacity to take the same set of facts and arrange them very differently in his mind and see something different to what other people see. Exactly where that comes from, I have no idea. I think that's maybe some combination of genetics and unusual upbringing. And uh, but I, it's not really clear to me. That's what makes Monish do these unusual investments. And that's what makes people follow him. And it's great that I have a front row seat. I get to learn every time we discuss stuff. And uh, the only thing that I've managed to do with Monish is that, uh, you know, I, I often am not convinced by him and I hold on to my views, which I think he quite enjoys when, when, when we end up having the debates. But, uh, and I think that probably in the audience, I think that two things. One is uh, um, acknowledge when somebody in your life has that kind of mindset and, and learn from them. There's nothing wrong with acknowledging in oneself one that one doesn't have that mindset and then figure out the people who do and get around them. You know, I even have discovered that when it comes to writing, there are specializations. Some people are good at editing. Some people are good at authoring, for example. When it comes to investment research and analysis, there are different people who have different strengths. You want to get yourself around people who complement your strengths. Surely, I definitely agree. And I mean, speaking of great mindsets, you already mentioned the, the joint joint lunch with uh, Mr. Buffett um, back in a time. When it, if, if I answered correctly, Guy, you, you were interested in doing a second lunch after that? Why was that? Uh, a second lunch with Warren. So, but, but yeah, my, my, my question was rather, I mean, um, I know that that uh, Monish, a, a um, introduction to, to Charlie Munger developed from the, the lunch with Mr. Buffett. Um, what was the motivation to, to do a second lunch? Um, with Mr. Buffett? I, I'm not sure that we did a second lunch. I think that we, we went multiple times to the Buffett brunch on Sundays after the Berkshire meeting. And uh, Monish has, a, he can talk about, uh, I, you know, it's it, 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 they lived in the same state, it, not exactly, they both love bridge. Uh, they both have similar minds. Uh, it, not exactly clear to me, but, uh, but that is now a private friendship with Monish. I, I mean, if you want me to riff on that, the one thing that I, I mean, I feel like I have a front row seat on that friendship. I think there's enormous learning that's happened for Monish through that friendship. I think I've learned through having a front row seat. And I've shared some of those ideas, I think even with the uh, St. Gallen group, this idea that some of the most kind and generous people develop a quite a gruff exterior because they have so many people coming at them and some of the most useless people that you don't want to be around have these incredibly seductive exteriors, which I kind of learned that lesson with the front row seat between Monish and, War and Charlie. But I, I don't know, Warren can speak, I'm sorry, Monish can speak to his relationship to Charlie better than I can. That'd be really interesting. And uh, as, as we've said, um, great, great mindsets in, in both Charlie as well as, as, well as um, um, Warren. Monish, how do how do they differ um, on a, on a maybe as personal basis as you want to go into? Um, what makes them individually succeed? Yeah, I'll just take a little detour before I I answer your question. So you know, I've I've talked about before that cloning is a great mental model. Another great mental model is doing things which have asymmetry and doing things where downside is muted or non-existent and upside is unknown you know and in fact 
if you look at a person like uh, Jeff Bezos or Amazon, that's what they do. They basically throw a lot of stuff against the wall. They're all relatively small bets. Most of them don't work, but a few do. And then uh, when they do, you get huge payoffs. And we see that investing in investing too. Like, for example, we, we talked about my Satyam investment, right? So, you know, uh, the 10,000 not working out is was like 1% of my portfolio at the time. And with the Buffett lunch, actually, I didn't really think about it at that times at that time in terms of asymmetry. But in looking back, that makes sense. But basically, I think in 2007, my net worth was over 80 million. Much of it attributed, almost all of it attributed to following Buffett and Munger and Graham's approach to investing. So in effect, I had lifted their intellectual property and I felt like there was a tuition bill due. You know, I, I thought to myself, well, what's a, what's a reasonable tuition bill to pay? I said, well, you know, a couple of million is definitely within the realm. It's just, you know, two and a half percent or whatever of the net worth. So my only desire with the lunch was to look Mr. Buffett in the, in the eye and just thank him for everything he had done for me, not just in terms of investing, but, you know, both him and Charlie have so many principles that will lead you to be a better human being and such. And of course, uh, uh, you know, we got it for a lot less than 2 million and Guy pitched in a third. So it actually was, you know, 400 odd thousand uh, for me, which was a perfectly fine sum. And then, uh, you know, it was buy one and get infinite free because that lunch led to a friendship with Warren. It led to an even deeper friendship with uh, Charlie. It led to a friendship with Warren's assistant, Debbie, which uh, continues to, to this day for both Guy and me. And, you know, I met Charlie's friends over the years. You know, I played a lot of bridge with Charlie and his friends. And the quality of those individuals is so high. And, uh, you know, I endeavored to make them my friends. So a bunch of Charlie's friends have become my friends, which, you know, so uh, when I look back on the lunch and what it led to, none of this was planned. You know, the plan was just to just thank Mr. Buffett and that would be the end of it. And and this repeatedly happens in life. Like, for example, when I started my first business, I took uh, 70000 in credit card debt and uh, 30000 emptied out my uh, retirement account. Uh, the downside was just the 30000 70000 would get wiped out in bankruptcy. But the upside was millions. And so there was, and you know, if it didn't work, I could just go back to take to a job or whatever. And that worked and it, you know, made me independently wealthy and all of that. So also, for example, in the last few years, I bought an insurance company. I raised a bunch of money and of course, we've uh, now returned most of it. That's a bet that didn't work. But again, even if it doesn't work, there's no downside. It was basically we, we were where we started and we didn't really lose anything. Basically, when I look back at a number of endeavors, I think the combination of cloning and asymmetry. Anytime you can identify asymmetry in some action or something that you could take, you should go for it. So for example, Charlie told me, and I've seen it with him, is he likes to introduce randomness into his life. So sometimes when I meet him, you know, from his coat pocket, he'll remove a bunch of letters he's received from people all over the world. You know, there's a lot of people who write to him and whatever. And he'll go through a few letters and say, okay, this one, I'm going to have breakfast with this person. <laughs> I'm just thinking, you know, that guy's going to fall off his chair when someone from, uh, you know, Charlie's assistant contacts him or something. But Charlie likes likes that randomness. It has led to many great friendships and in some cases, business partnerships for him. And again, there's no downside. And so, uh, you know, I moved to Austin and uh, what I do in Austin is at least a couple of times a month, I make incredible Assam tea. And a couple of times a month, I invite people I don't know over for afternoon tea. In fact, there's a person coming tomorrow who I've never met, you know, he kind of uh, lives in Monaco and he's got some apartments and stuff he owns here in uh, Austin and he's visiting and he asks if I could, I could meet him. You know, I have no idea how that meeting's going to go or what's going to happen, but you know, if it's not going so well, then uh, the tea won't go for so long. And on the other hand, uh, the last guy I met for tea I think uh, was amazing. I mean, I think uh, I'm meeting him again this Friday and it's incredible. So I think this, uh, the asymmetry and cloning, like, you know, I cloned the randomness from Charlie has a lot of, a, a lot of benefits. And the friendship with Charlie, you know, I, I always think when I meet Charlie, he's finally going to figure out one day the emperor has no clothes. He's going to figure out I'm a total fraud and whatever. And that, that'll be the end of my, uh, my meetings with Charlie. And uh, so far, 
uh, surprisingly, that hasn't happened. And I told Charlie when I was moving to Austin, I said, listen, uh, Charlie, just ignore the fact that I'm not in town. Anytime, you know, you're twiddling your thumbs for dinner, you can just call me and I can take a Southwest flight over and it's easy. And since I moved about eight, nine months ago, I think I've met him three times, twice for dinner and once once July for the harbor cruise in Santa Barbara with his family, which was really special on his uh, catamaran that he designed. Anyway, like I said, I think that it's it's led to so many things. I think I should do more. I don't do enough with asymmetry. I think Amazon does an awesome job with asymmetry. I think Tencent does an awesome job with asymmetry. I think Facebook does a terrible job with asymmetry. So the difference between Amazon and Facebook, even though you didn't ask, is you know the two Jeffs throw a lot of stuff against the wall. Basically, most stuff doesn't work, but it's small bets. You know, at Meta, there's a massive multi-billion single bet. And good luck with that. That kind of violates the rules. So I'm definitely sure that there will be a lot of people drafting letters right now to you. Uh, maybe someone will be lucky enough to, to, to have coffee or tea with you. Um, you, you mentioned how, how developing a, a circle around you, um, which is even might, might be more wise or has to be more wise to actually pick up stuff. Um, still, your, your day to day, um, or at least I imagine it to be um, as an as, as a investor, is, um, is not it does not involve as much teamwork and usually at university we are we are um we are not this this mindset of, of that teamwork works and and as a team you can achieve great stuff um what has um allowed you to to um, achieve all this this greatness um by yourself is it your personality that that's that set up to to work alone or is it even working alone well the a team is going to have difficulty getting to consensus on stuff that's distressed or hated or unloved. So I'll give you an example, right? I mean, I'm, I started visiting Turkey four years ago and I don't know how many of my friends, including one I'm looking at right now, you know, I've talked about the great merits of looking at Turkey because basically everyone and their brother exited and the valuations and, you know, there were some great businesses with great management and, and uh, great moats and such. And I've talked to so many people. I admire and no one's interested right i mean i i talked i talked to charlie about it and he said i'm not interested right <laughs> and uh, you know so and of course guy is not interested and and uh, and the thing is so i think the problem with the team is that if i were in in a team with you julius and your friends and i brought up you know this great company i found in turkey and we had to make investments by consensus it'd be really hard to get to consensus. That's why I don't believe investing is a team sport. And I think that what ends up happening if you're doing it as a team is, you know, you don't get fired for buying IBM. At least you used to not get fired for buying IBM. It's these businesses which are non-controversial, great businesses, great moats, and also at, you know, ridiculous valuations that everyone is comfortable with. And that's where you end up. So so I'm, I have some skepticism of teams at investing. I think you can you can have an analyst and you can have some people help you. That's okay. But it needs to be a dictatorship. Sure. So so having considered that you do it alone, um, what is it that you do, especially thinking of um, well now in, in an era of abrupt techno um, um, technological change, what is it that allows you or how do you actually um, pick out companies um, which you believe to, to have a great, great payoff in the future? Um, is there something, uh, especially considering the, the change in type of companies, um, that, that allows you um, to, to see these signs more clearly? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, it was, a, it was a combination of the two models of cloning and asymmetry. So there's a guy from Turkey who came to my annual meeting many years ago. He's a fund manager there. You know, very high quality guy. I liked him a lot. And I was seeing different things going on in Turkey. So I told him, listen, would you mind if I came to Istanbul and we just visited every business in your portfolio? And I had nothing else in mind other than doing that. I had no plans to invest in Turkey. It was one of those asymmetric things in the sense like, what's the downside? You know, there's an airfare and a few days in a great city and uh, a good guy. I know I knew he was a he was a high quality person. And he said, oh, yeah, this will be a lot of fun. And I spent a week visiting. It, the Turkish market has already been through one filter in the sense that I told him I don't want to visit any companies that he doesn't actually have an investment in. right? So it was already already business businesses that had gone through his filter and he put real money against them. 
And and then I did it again the next year. And I'm going to, you know, I've I've done it several times and I'm going to again do it in March next year. And so, so I, I think that's a good way to think about it is, you know, the combination of asymmetry and cloning, you know, two great mental models kind of intersecting is great. So this is all concerns public markets. Um, when did you realize that, that public markets were especially interesting for you? And then why are they still? Um, have you ever thought about of um, have you thought about incorporating other asset classes into your portfolio? Yeah, the public markets are unique. And I think one of the things that they have uh, to offer that is not available in uh, in other markets or asset classes is that you're not doing negotiated transactions. These are auction-driven markets, which are subject to fear and greed. So for example, I mean, let's say I look at some apartment in the, you know, city center, Zurich, nice two-bedroom apartment. Let's it's available for, I don't know what the price is. That. Let's say it's available for 1.5 million. Every day I ask a realtor friend of mine, hey, can you tell me the price of that apartment now? He would say the next day it's 1.5 million still. And then the day after, he would say, oh, listen, dummy, it's still 1.5 million. And if I kept doing it every day and he kept humoring me by giving me the current price, that price would probably range from between, say, 1.5 to maybe a, maybe a max of 1.7 million in a year, you know, maybe 10% or so movement in that in that one year. If I throw a dart at any random stock on the New York Stock Exchange, and I just look at the 52-week range on it, even a blue chip stock, you know, like let's say Microsoft or Amazon or whatever. I mean, the range I would see on these companies, even if I look, picked a company like Berkshire Hathaway, would be well beyond 10%. It would be more like 50%. And if that apartment were publicly traded, it would again have this 50% variance. So basically, in a negotiated transaction, you have an intelligent buyer most of the time. You have an intelligent buyer facing an intelligent seller, and they arrive, there's price discovery, and they arrive at a price that works. In auction-driven markets, especially if there is distress, you're going to get crazy pricing sometimes. You can get crazy pricing where things are very euphoric, kind of like you know Snowflake after the IPO or Carvana after the IPO and subsequently, or you can get extremely depressed pricing because it's it's faceless buyers and sellers doing different things <clears throat> which attenuate the ranges. So it's because of that more extreme attenuation that Guy and I are able to make a living. I think it's a lot harder if you if I were to go into private equity then you're you know you're playing other games like you're levering up and different things like that and you know putting lipstick on a pig sometimes and so on and so forth so uh, i think that it's harder to do it in most of the asset classes than it is in auction driven markets auction driven markets really are a gift to investors so realizing these, these asymmetries, um, how do you deal with the situation um, if, if those asymmetries you, you might see in, in um, stocks or markets that you are not too familiar with? I'm thinking of the, the circle of competence um, theorem. Um, maybe, so, so how, how does the situation come up? Do you then read in or how do you, how do you educate yourself? Um, and then how maybe has your circle of competence where you feel comfortable um, has developed over the, over the past years? Yeah, one doesn't need to sweat expanding the circle of competence. So I think when we are young and start out, there are relatively few things we understand. You know, we might understand mostly brands and companies that we are consumers of. Those would probably be the most apparent and most easy to get our arms around because we've got kind of experience with them. More, uh, you know, other businesses uh, which are not uh, consumer businesses might be more difficult. But over time, it is natural if you are, you know, reading and thinking a lot that basically the circle is going to expand. One doesn't need to focus on expanding the circle. It'll happen organically. But one one needs to be very careful that one when one is looking at something when which is outside their circle, outside your circle, that you're very intellectually honest and taking a pass. And, you know, many times the mistake I've made is I thought I knew something and I didn't. And so that that may not work out so well. Guy, Guy how has this developed for you? What's your take on, on your circle of competence and the development of this? You know, before I get there, I was just coming back on, on one thing that I just think is important knowing you and some of the students at uh, in St. Gallen is that, uh, and it's another of the many lessons that I learned from Monish, is that 
the reason why not working in a team works for Monish when it comes to investing is very related to the way that Monish's mind works. And it's worth saying that he was speaking, as I understand it, directly to investment decision making. Uh, there is a team around Monish, it's just that they're not uh, very heavily involved in the investment decision making, which is, as Monish said, a dictatorship. But if you're going to send e Monish an email, it's going to arrive at an assistance desk who will take a look at it. So there are other people around Monish. And I think that the more general idea is that we need to figure out what we do best. And there are some people who will only be happy working in a team, full time in a team. And I would argue, if, just speaking for myself, yes, the investment decision making ought to be made alone. Uh, but that doesn't mean you don't get enormous amounts of support and help from other areas of your life. And so uh, another area that I actually, I'll come back to this, but I think that Monish has really unique insight and expertise into the extraordinary changes that are going on in India. So I'm, Julius, I'm going to plant a question with you if you decide to ask it. Monish has some real estate investments in India. I think that's public knowledge. And some unique ways in which India has only started responding in a more Singaporean or Dubai way of looking at the world and kind of leapfrogging what is happening uh, in um, what is ha the way Western Europe and North America have developed, which is kind of exciting. He has more expertise, way more than I do. And so it would be a nice question to pitch to him. In terms of my circle of competence, well, first of all, I'll, I just uh, I think that from your perspective, Julius, or the, from the perspective of a student, uh, there's this question if you start approaching investing, which which goes like, you know, why the hell am I not Warren Buffett? Why am I not a genius at figuring out my uh, circle of competence? And the the and and I can spend time around somebody like Monish Pabrai saying, why the hell are you not Monish Pabrai? And sorry, just rewinding to another part of the conversation. For me, just remember that when when Monish and I teamed up to to do to bid on the launch, I'd met Monish twice. Before the launch happened, I actually flew out. No, I was on my way to Australia, and I specifically made a stop in Irvine because I thought I'd better get to know this guy a little bit better before the launch happens. For me, an enormous benefit of the launch was just this front row seat with Monish, and he has impregnated my thinking in so many ways. Uh, it, it's and In terms of how to live my life and how to, to run a business, I just want to give you one thing uh, that it kind of comes across in this conversation. Monish is completely relaxed. Why is he completely relaxed? It's because he is 100% 100, 100 truthful with the world. So he's not worried about how the conversation is going to unfold or what's going to happen. He doesn't even care what, he, he doesn't know what's going to happen, but it's okay because he's completely aligned with the reality of the world. He's not concerned with an external view of how people see him and how he himself feels about how he ought to be viewed. That takes away so much stress and tension, which just comes across in the conversation. When I met Monish, who I presented to the world and who I was inside was so far apart. And I got into knots. Just, you know, I'd call Monish up every five minutes saying, this friend wants to share the cost of the lunch with us. I'm not sure. Do you think we should get together and ask questions? We need to prepare the questions that we ask Warren. We need to have talked about it beforehand. He's like, he's like, guys, stop it. It's going to be just fine. Just leave it alone. So um, that's just something that is, is interesting for me that uh, the asymmetry for me, the upside for me, which was in a certain way, if you really genuinely, if you said, would I like to have met uh, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, would I like to have met Monish Pabrai? They would have been in a certain way wasted on me. All the all the learning that I've had through Monish has been better for me than if I would have just met Warren and Charlie once, for example. So when it comes to circle of competence, the real question is not why am I not Warren Buffett and figuring this out so well, is just how do I figure out where I am in this moment and how do I be brutally honest with myself about what I actually can know and do know and what I don't know and not worry so much about where Monish's circle of competence is or where Charlie Munger's, Charlie Munger's circle of competence is. I don't know if that helps you. And I think that, you know, in my case, which has come out many times before, although I have to say, you know, I'm, no, I'm not in Turkey for all sorts of reasons. We can get into it. But I have made investments in the Philippines where people tried to, which were successful. So, But in general, I'm, 
Uh, you know, we, we joke about it. I'm willing to do sports that I could get myself killed in, like cycling and various sports like that. But I'm very, very scared around losses of, of money. Uh, and Monash is like very, very conservative when it takes comes to his physical, because it, that's actually more important than whether or not you've lost a little bit of money one year. But um, And that's also fine. So I think that uh, the way I would define when I'm going through the world trying to figure out my circle of competence, I'm far more conservative. And I like to hang out around these you know, strong brands, for example. Whereas Monish, with his very unusual way of seeing things, will see something that is, is actually, he sees that it's within his circle of competence because he sees the whole world, including his friend Guy, just doesn't get it. And maybe the eighth time that I've been through it with him, I start understanding the way he's arrayed the facts. And it's like, actually, that makes a lot of sense. So, you know, maybe that then the, the situation comes into my circle of competence because I've learned his thinking. Uh, but the, my point to you is, don't, when you ask that question and when you ask yourselves, the group who are watching this, is this within my circle of competence? Don't have a voice that's sitting there saying, you idiot, you're not, Warren Buffett, you're not Charlie Munger. You don't have the insights that Monish Pabrai has. That's the least important thing. I'll stop there. I don't know if that's helpful. I hope it is. Back to you, Julius. Well, I think it, it surely is a very uh, mindset to be aspired. Um, the, the, the mindset you, Monish, um, uh, have developed. Is that something, as I, as I mentioned, that develops over time, which comes with more confidence w with oneself? Or how how was this achieved to be so truthful and... and um, relaxed with with the the place you are in well i mean i think a lot of it is uh genetic i think uh you know there's, there's traits we're born with there's some traits we can pick up but i i, I don't think you're going to take some hyperactive trader uh, and convert them into you know long-term value investors and have, have them be happy uh doing that so some of these inborn traits some can be learned but you're going to have difficulty if you're trying to do something which is very far away from what your natural tendency or bias is. So it's, it's really important to know yourself. You know, I've been around Monish when he's been with people who are kind of like in a very mild and perhaps even subtle way, misrepresenting reality in one way or another. And, it, you know, you can practically, I, I, maybe it's exaggeration to say there's a physical reaction in Monish, but he reacts to it very, very fast in a way that I think that when I first met Monish, I kind of like it was surprising to me. And I think I've now gotten better. But I, I suspect that that reaction to people who are not aligned. I, well, I'm curious. I'll ask you the question, Monish. Did you always have that or did it grow with time? No, alignment actually came about. Uh, I would say uh, the seminal thing that happened to me was I read this book, Power Versus Force. And basically what that what that book showed is that you can't really get away with lying. So basically, if you lie to someone and uh, you think they're not really going to know, there are things going on with your kind of body language and, and other things, which eventually will make that apparent. So actually, there's, on the other hand, if you're saying the truth all the time, you're going to, in the terms of the book, make people go stronger around you and they'll want to hang out with you. So we want to hang out around the Dalai Lama and we don't want to hang out uh, with used car dealers. You know, so, and that has to do with the truth. And when I read that book, what I, you know, I wasn't a kind of a dishonest, deceitful person, but what it helped me do is get rid of the small lies, get rid of the white lies. And that helped a lot. I mean, I think that getting closer to, you know, pure candor and pure truth is going to help you a lot in life in terms of uh, being trustable. And being trusted is one of the most important things. And it's got these extra benefits. But so one thing that I've learned from Monish, and I don't know where you got this from, is Monish, is that uh, you know, ninety-nine percent truthful gets you maybe half the way. It's that last one percent that gets you the full way. But there's something else, and I've seen this in two friendships that Monish has that I've observed, uh, in which one of the reasons why they want Monish around is they know he isn't going to sugarcoat the truth around them. They're going to get a, an honest reaction from him. Uh, John Elkan talks about truth tellers. Get yourself around truth tellers, and um, extraordinary benefits that you know. I still. I, it, what's amazing is that that's one of the books that Monish brought up in the first time I met him, 
And I learned so much from that book, but I don't think I've applied the lessons as well as Monish has. I don't think I've applied them in the same 100% way that Monish has. And uh, it's hard not to tell, want to sort of like tell, misrepresent in, 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 um, in ways that you feel like won't make a difference and actually is just maybe flattery or telling somebody that they look better than they do or, and it's that last sort of, and to do it automatically without even thinking about it, where that's where you live, that's the place where you live, so. Totally, and, and since I am myself being being educated so well here, um, Monish, maybe maybe let's talk about the Dakshana Foundation, which is involved in in alleviating poverty through education, which I personally personally see as, as a great and then the best cause of a foundation to have to um, work through through education. Um, thinking of education systems worldwide right now, obviously we are here at a university. What's your take and, and perspective on the, the current education system? Is there something um, to be improved, especially focusing, uh, since you're focusing on it in your um, foundation? Well, I mean, I think that when I look back at my undergraduate, undergraduate engineering degree, there are probably no more than two or three courses that had a long-term impact. I mean, the one course, which was an elective course that I just took kind of without really having much thought, which has helped me a lot, was a course on public speaking. And that was, I would have never guessed that that would have much impact, but it did. So I think that the way the, way the world works is employers are looking for shortcuts. And one of the shortcuts that employers take is that if you are graduating from an elite institution, some great employers are going to come over to basically interview you and try to hire you. So it's not so much what you learned at that institution. It's, that, it's just that that institution opens doors that would, would not be open otherwise. So I think in general, higher education and such has lots of inefficiency. I mean, if, if we go to a top end school, and this is just not, not just my, but my experience, but most people's experiences, they probably wouldn't be more than a, a couple of professors or teachers or courses that had some impact long-term on them. And so what that means is that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit over there. I mean, if I look at the IITs, which is where we send a lot of our kids, the IITs have an incredible incoming class selection filter. It's probably the best incoming class selection filter uh, amongst undergraduate institutions anywhere in the world. Uh, it's better than any any other university because it's so objective. There's no legacy and there's no you know subjective stuff which you know you're you're a big donor or whatever else. But so it's got great talent coming in. It has very mediocre professors. In some cases, I would say pathetic professors. And it has great talent going out. And again, the same thing. If you talk to IITians about what they learned at IIT, that was so instrumental. Uh, they'd kind of be scratching their head. Oh, I had this one great professor. Or I had this one great class or something like that. But basically what it, what it does is that these guys have so much horsepower and they also combine that with an ability to work hard. So horsepower with the ability to work hard that these great employers show up at IIT to recruit. And then these people end up at Amazon or Salesforce or Google or whatever, and they do really well. But it's not because of the IIT education. It's because of the filter. So I feel that when you know, people are spending two years or four years at these great institutions, they should get more than a couple of courses out of it. So there's a lot that can improve, I think. Surely, since I now had the, 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 the fortune to, to ask you so many questions, we want to get the, the, the audience involved now um, and we'll be taking questions. Um, you can post them in the chat and maybe you'll be picked or oh, there's one already. Um, we have someone asking in the chat, you have both um, have quite concentrated portfolios. Does this also mean that you want your investments to be uncorrelated? And if you have to choose between two rather um, two rather correlated stocks, what are your criteria? This is not only limited um, to, to you, Monish, so guy, if you, uh, if you um, well, I, share. I would just say, I would just say that uh, normally when I make investments in the fund, I, I don't, I, in fact, I've never invested more than 10% 10 of, 10 of assets in any one bet. Typically, ideally, it's kind of a 10 by 10 portfolio. There was a, a very good investor in India who passed away recently, Rakesh Junjunwala, and he never managed money, outside money, and he had probably less than, you know, $500 to his name when he started his career. He didn't live that long, actually died in his early 60s. 
and uh, when he passed away his net worth was north of 6 or 7 billion uh, you know no fees these all you know organic and he didn't run companies these all you know passive investments half that money was from one company so he made a 4% bet a few decades ago in a company called titan industries in india which ended up becoming more than half his portfolio and titan has done extremely well over the years going to keep doing well so if you think of someone like rakesh's portfolio let's say the other 96% of the portfolio went to zero he just hung on to his titan but he still end up with like 3 billion or something you know and so we start out i would say not that concentrated but if we but if the job is done right you would end up very concentrated so one of the things i i always kind of scratch my head about is that you know these very smart investors would buy mastercard after the ipo and you know they might be more diversified than me you know maybe they might have 20 positions which is fine no problem and so mastercard is like a 5% position and then it does really well and it becomes a 25% position or a 30% position because it's done so much better than everything else like jack nicholson said they can't handle the truth and in some cases their grandmothers took away certain body parts when they were 13 so you know they're done well it gets to 15% and they trim it gets to 17 they trim again and it never gets to even 20% right and to me i really scratch my head about that so yes you get a diversified portfolio but you're cutting the flowers and watering the weeds and that's not what rakesh junjunwala did and that's not what warren buffett did i think if an investment manager has done the job right they're going to end up with 80 90% of the net worth in one stock and the way they should think about that stock so if we think about the walton family and their ownership of walmart sam walton passed away a long time ago there are no waltons running walmart they might be a couple of them on the board but they really don't have much influence about the way walmart runs but almost all the waltons are extremely concentrated with 90% or more of their wealth in just one stock right so you don't need to be a founder or a founding family to have that concentration so my friend nick sleep for example you know hung up his boots he had three stocks and one stock amazon became 80% uh because it did so well versus and the other two one slouches but it did better than berkshire and costco and the way to think about amazon 80%, 80% is the way the walton family thinks about walmart stock when it's 80 or 90% which is you are effectively like the founding family and it's a great business and you just leave it alone and um and and but but this is hard this is hard for most people to do and uh, i think i have a lot of respect for rakesh because of what he was able to do on that front you know so um one of my painful episodes is that i owned one of those called krizzle i had met monish maybe once not even and i go to india for the first time i remember monish you gave me the book by dalrymple city of jins to read i don't know if you know that because uh, junjun valo was a significant shareholder of krizzle and so i went to his office to try krizzle is him. like the krizzle is like the moody's of india forgive me this is a uh, it was the first stock i've only owned i think three stocks in india I was looking for credit rating agencies around the world found Crisel uh bought shares in it went to visit uh made significant return on my investment but then convinced myself that I not only had to trim the flowers I pulled them out and threw them on the dustbin and um you know that that would have had a very significant impact on my net worth and the net worth of my investors if I'd stuck with it it's probably up 50 or 100 times since i sold it but monish so i go visit junjun wala's office somewhere somewhere on that kind of peninsula that is mumbai and there's just you know there's like about there's place for 20 people there and junjun wala's office is empty and there's one guy there's not a lock on the door even it feels to me i kind of just walk in and there's a guy who looks at me and says he wonders what i'm there for <laughs> that was it that was his whole office and uh just funny yeah sorry just a reminiscence yeah and 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 the thing is that you know we are old too soon and wise too late 
there are so many great businesses that i sold which i have a very deep regrets about you know i had ownership of something like 1% of ferrari in our funds you know what could be better than that and this idiot sold it and uh, the idiot's friend is smarter than him and he's kept yeah. it which is wonderful but only um, half as smart because i sold half of it at, at, just as we went into lockdown monish doesn't let me forget that by the way at, at least not the whole bunch of flowers were, were thrown away <laughs> like me we should kept some of them but but the thing is that but the thing is that you know with some luck i may have another 32 years or so on planet earth so there is still time to apply the lessons that took a few decades to learn but i think one of the big lessons is that you when you when you find yourself in the great position of of fractional ownership of a great business you don't really uh, try to do things like cute things like figure out intrinsic value etc when in 1972 you know Berks, uh, buffett and munger they always say that they have a perspective on what the intrinsic value of berkshire hathaway is and they say if both of them wrote down their numbers they would be they wouldn't be the same but they would be in the ballpark and i actually disagree with both of them so you know in the mid 70s berkshire stock was 40 dollars a share which is now over 400000 dollars you know so 10000 x what was the intrinsic value of berkshire in in the early 70s the the answer is that it was a really large number we don't know what that number was but we know it was a very large number now you could you could cr- calculate book value and you could give it some multiple on book value but what you're not taking into account is what if this you know great compounder of capital is sitting at the helm of this company for 50 years after that what happens then i think in a lot of great businesses we can get to liquidation value we can get to floor values relatively easily we really cannot get to intrinsic value because if they keep going and you go 10 20 30 years what does that look like i have no idea what that looks like but what you need to do is just stay on for the ride Great. Yes, we we have a lot of people awaiting answers in the chat. Um, how can students design their career to have a fund like Guy and Monish and be successful with it? So, how did you design your fund, and what's what's the take from it for students? Well, so the the simplest way to do that is I'll just tell you my journey is that start by you know whatever small amount of money you have, you start by building a, a track record. So you open an, a brokerage account and you start buying stocks. and the amounts aren't that important what is important is that you don't pay your grocery bills out of that account keep it so, so that you can later have that record audited if you've done well with that account where you've done significantly above market then you can you know you can go to friends family and fools especially the fools and uh, see if some of them will you know give you some money to uh, to add to that kitty and uh, you know uh, buffett says that if you are even a slightly above average investor they will sl- swim to you in the middle of the atlantic in shark infested waters to invest with you if you do a good job for the friends family and fools there will be more people who will show up to that party and it'll just keep going so basically the investment business is really simple do well for yourself do well for your friends and family and then the world's going to show up you know and I, i julius i just want to go to something even more basic that Uh, so I I have not had personal interactions other than maybe one book to Charlie Munger other than a book that I sent him and uh, he sent me a nice note back. But my experiences around uh, Monish and around Warren is that it's kind of like the way uh, they live their lives is that they're constantly leaving so much more on the table than they take, and it's in a thousand different ways. I mean. The funny thing is when when Monish developed this friendship with Charlie he bent over backwards to try and get me into the same relationship with Charlie it it was it was like he kind of drags me over at one of these brunches now sit down and talk to Charlie so and and he did that he wasn't he wasn't that's just the way he is and in a thousand other ways and uh Warren the same thing and when i realized that he's kind of doing small kindnesses for me Mr Guy Spear who's such a nothing in his life 
I just imagine how many other people he's doing it for. So I would just step back and say, yes, a very nice outcome would be able to be able to run a fund like Habri funds or Aquamarine fund. But there's a much more basic uh, mode of behavior to get to joy. And it's living one's life, constantly making sure that people, that you leave something on the table, that you, that, that you gave more than you took, and that you're somebody that people want to be around because good things happen when they're around you. And one of the outcomes might be running a fund. Because if you try and start running a fund and you don't have that modus operandi, you're unlikely, I think, to make a big success of it over the long run. So underlying all of that is a far more basic orientation. And I think that the reason why I just get so excited about that is that it's applicable to everyone. And I dove into investing with the desire to get rich but I didn't realize that I was going to learn some profound wisdom about how to live my life. And it's strange because once I understood it, I saw it in some people and some people just don't have it. And the book, the book I'm referring to here really is Jim Grant, Jim Grant, no, Grant, give and take. And you just really want to identify the people who are givers, not matches or takers. And you want to become yourself somebody who's a giver. And I think that that leads you to the promised land, whether it's running a fund or something else. Definitely, it all reminds me of, of concept, the concept of, of compounding goodwill, um, and and this then actually leading leading to payoff, which was not intended to be to be reached, but then reached. I believe we have, we have time for one last question. Um, considering the initiation phase of um, a young investor, what would be the mental model required to move on more easily from bad decision taken previously? Well, you know, Charlie Munger would say that you want to learn, but not learn too much. So this is a business where the best investor is going to be wrong one out of three times. And most likely, the mere models amongst us like me, we're probably going to be wrong half the time. But like we saw in the Junjunwala example, he only needed to be right on 4% of the portfolio. It didn't matter about the rest. So mistakes are very much a part of the landscape. We're going to make a lot of mistakes. And I think you need to be intellectually honest with yourself and you need to move on. You don't need to make the money back the same way you lost it. So once you realize that you've made a, a bet, which, you know, has led to a loss of capital and, you know, you have a better understanding of the business and such, it may make sense to just move on and, you know, learn what you can from that experience. Don't learn too much and keep going from there. I couldn't say it better, Julius. I think that's it's, it's a great, great note um, to to end our incredibly valuable session today. So thank you very much, um, both Monit and, and Guy, for, for spending the hour with us. Um, thank you in the name of the Elevation Investment Club and the whole university. For everybody who wants to re-watch this, this stream, it will be available on, on YouTube as well as LinkedIn. So thank you and, and see you soon, hopefully. Now, Julius, hold on a second. You, okay. That's very nice, of, but you didn't give us the chance to thank you. And I get the chance to say, you know, Monish, I know it's cold in Switzerland, but in summertime, it's really beautiful, first of all. Second of all, there really are a special set of students at St. Gallen. I was so impressed there and, and um, unusual minds. And it's a really stark campus. You know, if you think that Zurich is stark, think of <laughs> St. Gallen, it's like Eastern Switzerland, it gets even more stark. And... Um, but I just wanted to thank you. you. You, Actually, I would really say that I went out and gave a talk. I don't remember how long it was, but it was kind of inspiring to be amongst them. And so it's lovely to do this uh, streaming. But Julius, I still have this ambition that we will get Monish to St. Gallen at some point. Well, I have to say, Julius, that, you know, when Guy asked me to jump, I just say how high. <laughs> and so he told me, you have to do this talk with, with St. Gallen. And I am glad I, I said yes, and I really enjoyed the session, and I hope we can repeat this again. Thank you very much. Yes, yes. Uh, in terms of how high, let's aim for the stars, and hopefully we'll have you here on campus soon. So um, thank you again, and, and now let's, let's end this session. So see you soon, and thank you very much for being with us. Goodbye.